this important piece of legislation, House Bill 1256. Would you please proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And I will be brief, uh, especially out of consideration for this hardworking committee that met for so many long hours last night. I'm here on House Bill 1256, which is the Eyewitness Identification Accuracy Enhancement Act. This bill was brought to me by the Georgia Innocence Project. I have worked with them. Uh, some of you may recall last year I had a resolution which this body saw fit to pass uh, to compensate Mr. Clarence Harrison, who served uh, almost 17 years in the Georgia prison system for a crime he did not commit. And he had been wrongfully convicted primarily through the use of eyewitness, mistaken eyewitness identification. There are five other persons in the four who have other. Who, four other five total four other persons who've been wrongfully convicted in Georgia and subsequently exonerated in all of the wrongful convictions. The one um, common denominator in all those convictions was mistaken uh, eyewitness identification. And, and the studies show throughout the country that uh, wrongful convictions are primarily due to the eyewitness ID being flawed. Uh, so this bill is an effort to impose some standards that are based on studies. Uh, many of the studies date back for 20 years worth of scientific research. Uh, so th th there's, a, there's a rational basis for the procedures that are set forth in this bill. And the intent is to ensure that the eyewitness identifications that are made are as credible as, the, as they possibly can be. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Ms. Amy Maxwell, who is uh, the executive director of the Georgia Innocence Project and an attorney. And she can go through the bill in more detail. Um, I will say that, again, that all five people in Georgia who have been absolutely exonerated were exonerated. Um, even though their case is involved, absolutely positive eyewitness identifications. Now that, that is a problem on two levels. One is innocent people are in prison, but the second thing is the real person is out there. Recently, Robert Clark was exonerated after 24 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. The real perpetrator was identified using the CODIS database. He had been convicted of two other assaults, and they had two other cold hits on rape cases for him. So at least four other people would not have been attacked had the right person gone to prison the first time. The absolute critical piece of evidence in that case was the eyewitness identification. It was not a cross-racial identification, and the woman spent hours with him in the daylight, um, not where she could see him the entire time. So clearly there is a problem in collecting this information. First, there's a problem, I mean, human memory is fallible, and that's what decades of research has told us. The other problem is that we need to be very careful about how we collect this evidence. This is forensic evidence. This is trace evidence. If we don't collect it right at the very beginning, then we will forever lose the accuracy of this evidence. And that's what this bill addresses. There are three components to the most scientifically accepted procedures. All right. The, it's recorded sequential double blind and I'll come back to the recorded but the sequential part of this is traditionally lineups photo and live lineups have been done with a series of well the photo lineups a series of pictures there it's usually called, referred to as a six pack although the tendency now is to use more than six pictures but it's all six pictures are laid out in front of the witness the problem there is that what science has shown us, scientific experience has shown us, is there's a tendency to guess. There's a tendency to compare which of these people looks most like my memory. You're not comparing your memory to the picture. You're comparing your, all of these things, which one looks most like the person I remember. The way of changing it is very simple. Instead of laying them all out at once, you show the pictures one at a time. And I always use stacking, but it doesn't have to be stacking. And what happens there is you compare your memory to that picture. So it's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's that, does this picture match my memory? Not which of these matches best. And in practical terms, it's the difference between taking a uh, multiple choice test and a true-false test. With a multiple choice test, if you aren't absolutely certain of the answer, what you tend to do is pick the very 
best one you think it is. So that's what happens here. Now, one of the results of this is there may be less identifications, but what you're taking out is you're taking out the guesses, and you're getting to the really accurate eyewitness identification. The other part of the actual procedure is blind or double blind. And what that is is that is the way science does experiments, the way they do their own testing in medical research. You know, the person conducting the experiment doesn't know which one the placebo is. It's the same concept. The person who put the lineup together, the person who knows who the suspect is, does not conduct the, the um, lineup or is in positioned in a way that they can't see what picture the person, the, the witness is looking at. And what that does is it eliminates any of those human clues. And we are absolutely not saying that law enforcement intends to contaminate this evidence. It is a human thing. You know, you want to encourage people, look, you know, you did a good job. Or you want to, you really want them to pick the person you want them to pick. So you might say, you sure? You want to look again? Um, the, are there, there are physical clues that the witness might pick up on which contaminate this evidence. But by, ta by making it a completely neutral administrator, you take all of that out. Um, the final part is recording. We're not asking, I mean, the very best way of making sure you know what happened at, at a lineup is to videotape or audio tape. But that's not what this bill is asking for. It's just asking for at the time the eyewitness identification is made, write down what is the level of certainty? What does this witness say when they make the ID? Um, I will tell you that this, as, as Representative Benfield said, this research has been decades in coming. Um, the pivotal piece of research in these, this um, particular kind of technique was, um, I believe it was 1998 when it was released by the American Psychological Association. And it's also mentioned in the Department of Justice 1999 report, and let me be very clear here, it is a recommendation in the report among other recommendations of lineup procedures. They do talk about sequential lineups and, and what the benefit is and how you do them. Um, since that time, though, research has has exploded into how much more accurate these procedures are. And I will also mention that the way that police officers have been doing it for, for at least decades has no scientific basis. There is no scientific basis to say this is the right way to get it. It's just been local practice that has been done over and over and over again. And of course they're getting ident identifications from them so they keep using it. But the science in the eyewitness identification area is this is these are the best techniques. And I'm here for any questions. Any questions for Ms. Maxwell? Oh yeah. I said this sure. is based on uh, legislation that's been passed in uh, several other states. Right. Uh, Illinois has a pilot program. Correct. Uh, the only state that has a the entire state has no, Wisconsin, um, Virginia, and North Carolina. Some of them have passed them uh, the statewide uh, by commission, and some by um, other methods. But those states, and if you if you were to look, those are the states that have the high-profile exonerations, much like Robert Clark, you know, 24 years. So it's the states that recognize we've got a problem. We need to figure out what are the modern police techniques for doing this. Now, I will tell you that at the subcommittee hearing yesterday that I did mention that I had heard from Cobb and DeKalb County that they do these. Let me point out that I heard that from police officers I was dealing with while we were going through the two exonerations in those two counties. I have heard today that the chiefs of police and the training directors say they do not train this, but the people who are actually doing the lineups are the people who I was referring to. I do not have anything in writing that they have that training, so I need, do want to clear that up. But, um, you know, there are many, many departments using this, and um, the four states are definitely using this. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Ms. Maxwell? Yes. How many mistakes are they made? I mean, when, for the amount of crimes that we have, and pictures are laid out there, do, is there a number hmm. of is there some sort of statistic that out of, say, 20 people, there's a mistake by four, or are all 20 mistakes? What a fabulous question, and I'm sure I've read it, and I don't have that number, and I'm not going to 
just you know pull a number out of my head. So what I, I'll do is I'll look through what I've got, and if I've got one, I'll let, let her know the, the exact number. I'd bet you say, if I can't, I can jump in, I'd bet you say that it's more often than not that it's an error on, based on eyewitness testimony. As a defense lawyer, you know, the only thing better than an eyewitness is having two eyewitnesses. Right. Well, I, I think research, I think just the social science research on memory and identification is that the, probably the most notorious kind of evidence is an eyewitness evidence. I mean, because because of the stress of the situation. So the way it's done in these other states that are doing this right now, they take one picture at a time. It's on a stack. It can be on a stack, it can be on a computer, it can be, you know, but it's folders. Yes. One, it can be folder one picture at a time as right. opposed to four or five or however many may Correct. be there. But they can be the same pictures, but it's just one at a time as opposed to a big spread. All right, other questions for the author or for Ms. Maxwell? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, page four of the bill. Uh, line t beginning with line two, uh, excuse me, beginning with line four there where it states the eyewitness shall be asked to state for each photograph of a person whether the individual shown is the perpetrator of the crime prior to viewing the next lineup photograph or participant. Uh, and my focus is on that next sentence there. Has there been, in your research, have you discovered yeah, a percentage of uh, when this has been done where comments are asked of the eyewitness by the individual performing the test? Because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming here that that's the reason that was placed in there because is there a potential for misleading statements to the eyewitness to get them to uh, state that that is the person they are looking for, looking at? Well, one of the problems, of course, with, with any kind of percentage is that a lot of these things are done without being recorded in actual interrogation rooms, and, and the lineups are done at police stations where there is no, you know, scientists watching it. Um, and I, I do know that the number one recommendation of all scientists in this area is that the person be neutral. And one of the reasons is because if you give any kind of feedback, then you taint the evidence. So as far as percentages, no, I can't give you those because those would be experimental percentages. But that is the number one thing that they are trying to prevent is any sort of encouraging or discouraging. Or of misleading so, statements. So it becomes a clean gathering of evidence rather than any sort of contamination. All thank right. you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. We have some other people that have signed up to speak on this matter. Uh, first one would be Frank Rotondo. Seems like we just left. We did. Yeah. Go ahead, Frank. Thank you. My name is Frank Vincent Rotondo, and I'm the executive director of the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, by way of some of my credentials, I've had 38 years in law enforcement. That sometimes makes me a dinosaur and sometimes doesn't. I've been the executive director of the police chiefs for 10 years. Uh, I've also been a police chief as well as a uh, in a very large law enforcement agency, an investigator in major crimes and in homicide, and you could tell from my accent it's not North Fulton County. Okay, it was was in the state. Ellen, right? <laughs> no, no, I was a police chief there, but no, no, sir, wasn't. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I do have some concerns about the bill. I, I'm I'm not saying the bill is a terrible bill. I have concerns, and I think my biggest concern is, and I, I don't mind voicing it, is that frankly the bill was dropped in two weeks ago. I, I became aware of the bill, but I have not had su substantial amount of time to do research on the validity of the statements made by Ms. Maxwell. I have no reason to doubt that Ms. Maxwell is a learned individual, 
But once again, she has not permitted the liberty of any kind of participative approach to, to looking at maybe changing this procedure. And that becomes significant because we're asking the Public Safety Training Center to redo lesson plans from a format and a standard which has been constitutionally, both Georgia as well as uh, federally, acceptable which originally started, and I'm not an attorney, but I think somebody, Ms. Maxwell, might have mentioned it, the Bickers case, uh, and even reinforced in an Allen case in, in the year 2004, is saying that basically these are acceptable standards. What are the standards? Well, after appearing at the subcommittee yesterday and vacillating, saying that I didn't really clearly know what the lesson plans say, I can tell you right now that Dale Mann at the Public Safety Training Center was kind enough to actually come on down and speak with uh, Representative Stucky Benefield and talk a little bit about it. But basically there are safeguards associated with it. This is not 20 years ago. That we've come a long way, and one of the safeguards associated is what's called a, a blind photo array, where basically what a blind photo array is, and it's recommended at least be done once, is that you take a photo spread or a photo array with six photographs, similar looking obviously to the suspect, and, and you take that photo array, and the first one always should be lacking the suspect of the case. In other words, the bottom line is similar but not the suspect in there. You could present a second one, you could present a third, but you know, somewhere down the line you'll be presenting a photo array with the suspect in there. So it makes it less tainted or susceptible uh, for the person to kind of think that the suspect will be in the first six photos presented to them. There's a stack and they say, look at it. So that's one of the techniques used. What does concern me about the bill uh, is the, I think it's called the neutral blind administrator in there. Now there's no question that people should be neutral and they shouldn't telegraph what their intentions are. And I concur with Ms. Maxwell that sometimes that may be inadvertently done. Uh, the blind, the neutral blind administrator, as opposed to blind neutral administrator, the neutral blind administrator, uh, that particular person could be somebody from the department, it could be somebody from the outside, but it's bringing another person into the chain of evidence possibly to even testify, which becomes problematic. There's a whole litany of things that do concern me about that, including some of the statements made yesterday by Ms. Maxwell and several other people, and she was kind enough to clarify it, uh, several of those statements made. I, I took it upon myself after yesterday's meeting to contact the chief of Cobb County Police Department and DeKalb County, because both of, both of them were mentioned as some of the metropolitan Atlanta area departments that perform their their photo, uh, their their pre-trial identification in the manner that Ms. Maxwell subscribes should be, uh, as, as well as, as uh, uh, Representative Benefield, uh, subscribes should be done. And both of those chiefs, including I spoke with their training directors, say that is not true. They don't do that. I contacted the Justice Department here in Atlanta. They were baffled. They said, we've never heard of a, a neutral blind administrator. You know, whether there's truth or not to this really will take some time to look at it. And, and I seriously would like to have this body, as well as the author, consider allowing the liberty of the people who design the lesson plans, who look at the constitutionality, meaning defense attorneys as well as prosecutors, determine whether it is appropriate to take this big step forward. Well, this is a big step forward. We have three states involved in it. That, that doesn't mean those three states are correct. That just means three states are involved. We have a handful of relatively small law enforcement agencies. It doesn't mean that they're correct when they, when they do this and they've gone to this. The state of New Jersey appears to be the, the biggest supporter of this, and I did read a document that Ms. Maxwell was kind enough to let me have. But the other two reference sites for websites to the other two states, Virginia, and I forgot what the the state was right offhand, but they refer to Ms. Maxwell's organization at a national level as let's follow these guidelines. What that basically tells me is Ms. Maxwell's organization is pretty well developed and they were able to exercise enough influence to get the pretrial identification in those states done. Illinois did something smart. They did a pilot program. I'm saying to this body, let's look at it objectively. Let's not throw out uh, 
based upon some bad IDs. That may have occurred 20 years ago. The, the training and the experience and the constitutional acceptance, both Georgia as well as federal, of current pretrial identification. Let's not make it more difficult to put the wrong the, the right person in jail as opposed to the wrong person. And, and I concede the fact that errors were done over the years in law enforcement. We've just come a long way. This is not 38 years ago when I started. You know, th this is the year 2006, and, and we've evolved. Our law enforcement personnel have evolved, and our training has evolved, and our standards have evolved. Questions? I'll certainly take them. Any questions for Mr. Rotan? I know, uh, I know that Chairman Knox had one. Or did you? Go ahead, Lady Fern. Go ahead. You know, I don't mind saying so. Well, thank you very much. With this kind of procedure, are we going to have to go send everyone to a school, or how are they going to learn this process? Yeah, well, that, that if you were to establish this procedure, a lesson plan would be developed. And there's no instant way of getting everybody educated on this. But more than that, it's the acceptance of the procedure that becomes really critical. That's why I suggest very strongly you really kind of need a, a buy-in to, to get it done. But yes, you would have to. You'd have to probably ask everybody who wishes to conduct lineups, show-ups, and photo arrays to, to go through a training class associated with it. Now, in most of the larger departments, usually just the investigators are the ones that conduct that conduct the investigations and the lineups associated with that. The smaller departments, particularly in the extreme portions of the state, uh, don't have the staff to do that. And if they do it, uh, they, they do it attempting to follow almost a, a little manual, and they'll try the best they could to follow those. But now, m many of the smaller departments defer to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, which would require you know, a retooling, so to speak. To do that. But once again, it's been accepted for, for years. This is acceptable, constitutionally acceptable way of doing it now with, with many challenges. And we're allowing the judge to look at whether it was done correctly and the judge to eliminate the evidence. You know, we're, we're, we're taking that almost liberty away from them. And since we haven't done this before, do we know if it's going to be any kind of cost? I would suspect there really would be a substantial cost on the training issue, which to me says that with a substantial cost to, to train everybody, there's an appropriations that should be considered on this. Public Safety Training Center is grubbling around now for money. Now, about the Public Safety Training Center, in case you, you don't know it, they, they're the ones who set the lesson plans and the basic, what are called ports material, which is the Peace Officer Standards and Training Manuals. Um, and and they, they train basic law enforcement officers through not only that particular unit of government, but the satellite academies. It all falls under the control of the Public Safety Training Center, including their allocations of funds associated with that. I myself will have a, a training issue. Uh, under state code, the police chiefs are trained through the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police. And as I mentioned yesterday, we have a training director. I will have a training issue and a, f a fund issue associated with training police chiefs to understand if, in fact, the change occurred, what the foundational basis of that change is, have to then try to convince them that the change was necessary, which includes trying to support documentation I have not seen other than its briefest form because of the kindness of Ms. Maxwell to give it to me. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Rotonda? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jacobs. I, I have a question. Well, first of all, I mean, I, I understand the current process. I mean, this is a point I've made, uh, I think, at yesterday's hearing on another subject. And the current process may be constant constitutionally valid. I mean, it may have passed muster, but, you know, in this area of the law, uh, you know, there, there are always constitutional challenges anytime you change the law. And, and ultimately, you know, if you come up with something better, yes, it's probably going to be challenged constitutionally, but I, I think this, you know, what we have in this bill would pass constitutional muster. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, I, actually, just a question about the uh, you made reference to the pilot program in Illinois. The author talked about it, um, and it's Miss Maxwell mm -hmm. uh, talked about it as well. I'd be interested to know the status of that. Anyone 
who, who knows the status of that program? Has it been expanded at this point? Uh, is it is it just so new that it hasn't been expanded? I'd like to kind of know where it stands and what Illinois has found. I believe Mr. Tonji has yeah. the most updated information. I, I, does this mean I'm taking a speaker out of order, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Um, sure, I think. Um, well, come go on. Ahead, you sir. want to come on up, or you want? To, there's a chair here. I'll, I'll share my seat with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the Illinois Commission came out of uh, Governor Ryan. Uh, you may remember when Governor Ryan um, uh, commuted everybody on death row's sentence to life in prison when they found that more than half the people on their death row were exonerated. Um, or no, sorry, more than half of the sampling, which was I think it was um, it was 26 people out of those 14 of those people were exonerated. They realized they had a really big problem on their hands, and they started this pilot program. The pilot program is is in its final measures um, right now, and we're waiting to see what that will report. But as far um, to, to my best knowledge, the pro program's been going very, very well, and they can't take a minute to say why. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. To, this question is addressed to whomever can answer it. I'm concerned about, or not concerned, but I need a little more information on this neutral blind administrator. Who would that person report to? What payroll of that individual? What's the? I understand the role, but who is this person reporting to? Actually, that phrase just came to me one day ago, so I guess Ms. Maxwell is probably the best to reflect upon that. That person would either already be part of the department, it would just be another police officer, or if the department doesn't have another police officer, there are other mechanisms, for instance, if it's a computer program or just using file folders. Um, so it's and keeping the file folders, keeping the person conducting the um, examination on the other side of the file folder. So we really would not require any additional personnel. Okay, so it's not an augmentation of additional personnel, and it it would be someone that's currently in the police department. Yes. Okay. In that particular police department, and if they don't have anyone, then there are other mechanisms they can use. All right. For thank little you. or no cost. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? We have some other speakers. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I just refer you, um, probably seen it, but page two, line 18, which is the definition of the blind administrator, and I think it's intentionally broad in allowing a person, so it could be employee of the department and bring in someone else, but while unaware, so... Right, that, that, right I, I read that, and that was my concern. I wanted to uh, refine it to see if they would be allowed to bring in an outside person from the police department, and who would be responsible for that. Um, just to ask a question, yes. I think one of the problems that, that apparently uh, Representative Everson's having the term blind administrator sounds so formal it's almost like we're having some administrator that's administrating nothing but lineups uh, that would not be the case at all would it, uh, what you're talking about here is that somebody that doesn't know what the answer to the question is is administering the test okay. Mr. Chairman that is the term used in the, in the scientific right. research it's not a separate um, it just sounds so formal it, doesn't it, it does. <laughs> right all right. With, with that, if you don't mind, I'll step sure. down. Can I make one closing comment? Sure. And, and that comment, realistically, is we're looking at everything, any conviction based upon one factor here, which is obviously the, the witness identification. I, I know, as well as everybody here, recognizes that an attorney would probably be very foolish to go in with just an eyewitness identification as a form of evidence <laughs> alone. Certainly, even in the case where the gentleman spoke yesterday during the course of conversation with him, there was eyewitness testimony deemed to be apparently incorrect with some serology, which apparently was a very weak form of evidence. We have much stronger forms of evidence now in evidence collection. So, you know, there are other supportive mechanisms. And my fear is realistically, if this is not followed correctly as a, as a chain, it's deemed to find that you know, the law enforcement officer or the department violated the procedures set forth in this and in lesson plans, and they throw out that uh, lineup identification. And I could be wrong since I am not an attorney, and there are many attorneys here. My question is will admissions which result as a result of that eyewitness testimony be thrown out? Will physical evidence be thrown out? Will it be under more scrutiny? So I'm worried about. 
obviously the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine kicking in, which becomes substantial. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and I thank the members of the committee. Thank you. Jack Martin signed up. Is Jack still in the room? I can't see. Yeah, oh, you're hiding. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, maybe I can provide a little bit of more information uh, about some of the factors in the case and actually some statistics that might help the committee. Uh, let me tell you, I've been practicing criminal defense lawyer for 25 years, and the six-pack, as Ms. Maxwell described it, is the standard way identifications are done in every criminal case. And there are criminal cases, especially rape cases, that are prosecuted on a single eyewitness, usually the victim. And that's the two people, many of you were here yesterday, uh, were, came into this courtroom, my courtroom, this, this committee room over there, and y'all saw the eyes of people who were actually innocent, who were convicted on eyewitness identification testimony. And this is something we, that there's been a growing body of research over the years, going for the last, actually more than 20 years. There are numerous articles published, and I've, I've seen a lot of these journals in some of the cases I've handled. Elizabeth Loftus is considered to be the national expert in this subject. And if you've ever heard or seen her presentation, you really understand the problems with eyewitness identification. But these are articles that are published in the Journal of Applied Psychology, Law and Behavior, Law and Human Psychology, the American Psychologist. Let me mention one of the 1993 studies by the American Psychologist. It's a very interesting study that showed this is what happened. They had a lineup. And the, a lineup or a photo spread is the same thing, basically. But one's alive people, the other's six pictures. And generally speaking, I think police officers try to make the lineup fair. People look generally like, at least they're not, there's not too much problem with the identification. They were told the perpetrator may or may not be in the lineup. The first time around, there was an actual perpetrator in the, in the lineup. 50% of the people identified the correct person. They did the lineup again with another group. Again, there was no perpetrator in the group. Told the exact same thing. 34% of those people identified a perpetrator, even though there was no perpetrator in the lineup. Both of those indicates what happens, and it's just, just think about it, it's human nature. The, what happens is the victim, especially in a rape case, the victim really wants to identify the perpetrator. And what you generally have, and the biggest problem all the research shows, is cross-racial identifications. That's where you have the biggest problems. So if you have a cross-racial crime, a white victim of a black perpetrator or vice versa, and they're trying to identify, and it's just the studies are replete to show that people just <coughs> on cross-racial identifications have the most problem. This is where we have the most trouble in the criminal justice system. They know that a perpetrator has been arrested. Otherwise, why are they being shown this lineup? <laughs> well, there's a real suspect. So they give them a lineup, and they're saying, well, gosh, one of these people is my attacker. And they are forced almost psychologically to pick somebody out of that lineup, even though it might not be that person. And once hap that happened, this is what always happens in my experience, the cop says, good, you got the right guy. That's who we arrested. And that from that day forward, in that person's mind, just like in the Harrison case with yesterday, that person is the person who attacked her. We also know, and there's plenty of studies to show, that the worst possible time to make an identification is when you're under stress. The, the, the evidence indicates in a bank robbery, the only reliable identification by tellers is of the weapon because you have what you call gun focus. And there's a Georgia case on this, the Johnson case, where people are focused on the gun. And I know I would be. The thing I'd be looking at is that gun. And that's the worst possible time to make identification under stress. And in a rape situation, often dark, often cross-racial, you even have a bigger problem. Um, regards to studies, anecdotal studies of, of actual perpetrators back many years ago, I think this was like in like the 40s, the, 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 they found that approximately 25% of the lineup identifications, people identified a filler, the wrong person, person who was put in the lineup. They had their actual perpetrator, ultimately proved that was the right perpetrator, but in lineups, 25% of the time, they picked out the wrong person. So this is a big problem, and we are learning how to deal with it. One of the things Elizabeth Loftus, I learned from her, and the Georgia Supreme Court had enough sense to adopt this based on evidence that was presented in court, is that the more certain the identification is, the more unreliable it is. That is 
absolutely counterintuitive, is it not? All of us say, well, if the person was really certain, and you've seen that in court, person, can you see that person? How certain are you? I'll never forget that face, though that's burned in my memory. The more certain they are, the less reliable. The Georgia Supreme Court just recently changed the pattern instruction in Georgia to take out the factor of certainty being one factor to be determined. So all of these things mean that we have a problem. And it's, as a criminal defense lawyer, I'm interested in reliability in the process. We're often here arguing about procedural technicalities, but here we are arguing for something to make it more reliable, both for the, to catch the right person and to make sure we're not punishing an innocent person. Let me mention a couple of things which I think are maybe red herrings in all of this. One is the notion that this somehow or another will be the basis for a motion to suppress. Um, as you mentioned earlier, case law is quite clear what the constitutional standard is for suppressing a, a um, suggestive lineup or suggestive identification. Niels versus Biggers is the famous case back in the 30s. Supreme Court dealt with this. And that's the consistent standard throughout. It is the consistent standard for Georgia. So for before any identification could be suppressed because of some failure to live up to some portion of this, you would have to prove a Niels versus Bigger uh, uh, violation. This act does not, and intentionally, does not include any language that says if you don't follow this to the T, it's suppressible. It's just one factor for the court to consider under Niels versus Biggers, which has been the <coughs> consistent constitutional standard for years. There is one thing that probably needs to be corrected and I talked to Mary Beth Westmoreland uh, about the Attorney General's role in this. And on page 2 at line 26, the Attorney General, this is model legislation. And the, the Attorney General in Georgia typically does not get involved with standards training. So I think it's hard to read that we should take out the, the Attorney General language. And we should just say prior to January 1, 2007, the Georgia Police Officers and Standards Council. And that's the body in this state that creates standards. Let me talk about cost. The Georgia, the post-training already has materials on identification. The problem is, is they're teaching invalid techniques, or they're teaching old techniques, they're teaching techniques. They need to update it. And the research is there. It's easily available. All they need to do is update their curriculum, update their standards. This is not a big cost. Indeed, the cost to the state is the, the cost like uh, the, 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 uh, the defendant that y'all compensated just last term. Those are the types of costs. But just the human, tragic human cost of people serving time when they shouldn't be serving time and perpetrators going free because we identified the wrong person. Those costs are staggering compared to the minimal cost of implementing this. Um, how many mistakes are made? The question was asked. Um, it's hard to say. And, and since it's so unknowable, it seems to be no reason not to do or implement what is the best science that is available. I have available, and any questions you might have, I can actually cite to percentages of tests and so forth to show why this is needed. Um, it is the recommendation of the American Bar Association. Uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, New Jersey implemented this by court ruling. Other states have done it where they've had a problem by legislation. Um, Representative Cooper yesterday, I think, made the good point, you know, uh, we, why are we always the last to do something? Why can't we be one of the first to do something good? Uh, and I think this is an opportunity for Georgia to do something, to be part of the lead, a leading state on developing reliable uh, mechanism for eyewitness identifications. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. Are there any questions for Mr. Martin? We have one other speaker that wanted to speak on this. Any sure. questions for Mr. Martin? Yes. I know it's kind of obvious as I'm presenting the bill, but I do have a, a question, and that is sure. when eyewitness uh, identification is used currently in Georgia law, are you allowed to bring in experts to t talk about the fallibility of eyewitness identification? Under happen? the Johnson case, it's on a case-by-case uh, the judge has discretion. It used to be in Georgia and the Eleventh Circuit disallowed eyewitness expert testimony altogether. It was, it was a per se ban. The Johnson case changed that and said that the judge, depending on the circumstances of each case, and the Johnson case, as I mentioned, was a gun-focused case, but depending on the circumstances of each case,
that is allowed, but it's in the discretion of the judge. You have no absolute right to that testimony, but the judge is authorized to do it. Um, I heard that exchange, and I understand what y'all just said, but I'm not sure you made it clear. Your, the question was about whether you can bring in an expert to criticize the manner in which the police identification yeah. took place, not just discussing the, ident the, the identification, but to... Right. It'd be an expert for the defense that would talk about the errors and failures. Right. There are two, two places the expert can come in, either in a pretrial hearing to see whether or not it's so suggestive it shouldn't even be allowed, or at the time of trial. But it's always in the discretion of the trial judge. Okay. All right. Olive K. Hunter. Thank you for coming to testify. You indicated some very important statistical bases for this legislation, and I know that the author has some of, that legis some of that statistics. Could you share some of that at, uh, at your earliest with some of the sure. committee um, so that the committee can have those statistics? I think that's very sure. telling, some of the t statistics that support this legislation. I can provide, actually, there is an article by Gary Wells, who is a professor in, I think, University of Iowa, <coughs> who is a leading, leading expert in this area and has a wonderful website that collects a lot of this data. We can provide that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Oliver Hunter? Olive Hunter? Oliver. Oliver. I'm sorry, Oliver. I apologize. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It looks like Olive K. Hunter is what it looks like on my... That's a funny R. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Oliver Hunter with the Georgia Sheriff Association. I have very few comments about the bill. And I guess what I really... My comments pretty much are couched in terms of questions. And um, my concern is that if we should adopt this, whether or not we'd be codifying... Um, just simply one way in which you can do um, uh, lineups and the problems inherent in, um, in doing that. Um, unless there's a court decision that I'm unaware of that would dictate a show there's only one way to do this and this is the way we're codifying that. My concern is that we'll be, by doing this, eliminating other valid processing ways in which we could do our constitutional lineups. And um, um, any time you um, would um, not meet and hit every single standard as outlined in the bill like this, a law like this here to be adopted, that you will be setting yourself up for some procedural problems in terms of evidentiary admissibility. And those are the concerns I had. Um, and I guess in terms of questions, I guess, to the committee, are we in fact doing that? Should we adopt this? in terms of saying this would be the single and only way by which you could conduct a ballot um, lineup. And uh, if it's so doing, it's that we want to do to say that um, this would, in fact, be the only way to do that because there are no dictates out there saying, the court cases I'm aware of, that saying you've got to do it this way and only this way. There may be several possible ways, and I think we need to allow that discretion per agency in terms of how they best want to accomplish and do the lineups. And those are my concerns uh, as it relates to the bill. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions for Oliver Hunter? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One question. Why is the room not filled up with uh, law enforcement officers? It is a sarcastic statement. Okay. I guess that. But, but thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. All right. Are there any other? Um, is there anybody else that wanted to speak? Chuck, you want to say anything? Only I can. Some of the rules I operate only if you can ask me questions can I respond. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, that's Chuck with the PAC, Prosecuting Attorneys Council. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, uh, just to reiterate, what I'm Mary Beth Westmore with the Attorney General's Office. I'm just to reiterate what Mr. Martin so kindly said. Is that the bill does mention the Attorney General, and I've mentioned this to Representative Jim Field. It's simply not the kind of thing our office is, is 
equipped to produce and I think training centers is the agency that does training in any event and so we just like to request that the Attorney General not be designated or required to do something that is not equipped to do. And are, you're familiar with the bill. My understanding is the only mention of that is on line, each, line 26 of page 2. That's the only place That's that correct. the words the Attorney General in consultation with need to be struck. All right. All right. Um, what is the uh, will of the committee? Yes, ma'am. All right. And we haven't had an amendment yet. Is somebody going to make an amendment? All right. Go ahead, Mr. Jacobs. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we amend um, House Bill 1256 um, by striking on line 26. Uh, the Attorney General in consultation with and on line 27, the comma. The comma after counsel? Correct. There's only one comma on that line, Mr. Chairman. I, I wouldn't do that to Chairman Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to show me up, aren't you? <laughs> All right. There's an amendment on the floor. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. It has been seconded. Is there any discussion of the amendment? Everybody understand it? All those in favor of the amendment, raise your right hand. It seems unanimous. All right. The bill has now been amended, and I guess we would call it a committee substitute. <coughs> Is that correct? Is there a motion on the bill? Move due pass as amended. All right. Uh, by committee substitute. By committee substitute as amended. All right. It's been a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say, please, please raise your right hand. Okay, it seems unanimous. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's the only bill we have today. I want to thank everybody for...